Good evening. Tonight's guest on Gallery of the Arts is Wyatt Cooper. Mr. Cooper was in Nashville recently attending the Swan Ball, along with his wife, Gloria Vanderbilt Cooper, whose exhibit of paintings and collages is still on display at the Tennessee Fine Arts Center at Cheekwood. Wyatt Cooper, a New York playwright, was born in Quitman, Mississippi. And when we talked together on the day after the Swan Ball, I told him how delighted we were to have him and his wife here in Nashville, and I asked him if this was his first visit here. Yes, it is, and you're not more delighted to have us here than we are to be here, because we're very excited and having a marvelous time. Gloria's uh, obviously been aware of Nashville for a long time because of uh, Vanderbilt University, with which she's had family connections. But it, it, it was her first time here, and it's my first time here. But my uh, 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 excitement about coming to Nashville largely has to do with the fact that I grew up listening to the Grand Old Opry every Saturday night. I was uh, born in Clark County, Mississippi. And the thing that people did on Saturday night, if they didn't have a radio, they went to a neighbor's house who had a radio and listened to uh, uh, Uncle Dave Macon and Roy Acuff and... Uh, Bill Monroe and the Smoky Mountain Boys and all those people. One of the, the most exciting moments for me uh, on this whole trip is last night we met Johnny Cash and uh, June Carter. Now, I have the uh, records of the original Carter family made in you know late 20s and early 30s, I suppose. Uh, A.P. Carter and uh, his wife, and I guess Maybell was the sister-in-law. So it was very exciting to me to meet them last night because I... Uh, Sweet Fern, uh, uh, Maple on the Hill, and all those songs mean a great deal to me. Well, I knew that. You had told me that uh, previously. And as Johnny Cash was entertaining last night, I looked over and watched your face while you oh. were listening to him, and I could see that you were really absorbing the whole thing and enjoying it so much. Well, you know, we went backstage to meet him, and he's a very moving man, both... Uh, to meet and also to see perform because there, there is in him an enormous strength and it's combined with a, an incredible kind of sensitivity and vulnerability and there's nothing more moving than that. And he has a kind of um, presence that's really extraordinary. There is in it something that, that, that has to do with uh, the forest and primitive things and the strength of, of people who wrestled a harsh living from the land. And, and I, I, I'm sure he's something that, that, that uh, Nashville is uh, very proud of, and uh, well they might be. Because that music, which um, meant a great deal to farm people when I was young, uh, I am happy to see uh, people recognizing it as the art form that it is, because uh, it, it's a remarkable and, and very American art form um, that, that does speak of the kind of living that people had who were building a, a country out of, out of wilderness and out of mountainous land and, you know, uh, wrestling a living from the land. And it has the strength of the people and the kind of simple uh, faith and courage and uh, companionship of, of, of country people, which is a marvelous thing that we, we must be very proud of and, uh, and, and not lose contact with our roots you know, as a people and as a country. Because a lot of times as people kind of move up in the world, they, they, they dismiss that background as something that's uh, something slightly to be ashamed of. And it isn't. It's the thing that one must be proud of. Because one is, you know, what one is. When you were describing Johnny Cash just a moment ago, I could almost see that as a description of yourself. I think you have much of that same feeling, and maybe that's the reason that you appreciate it so much in, uh, in Johnny Cash. Well, uh, I don't know. I, uh, 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 I mean, it's a nice thing to have you say, and, 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 and I, I, I don't know really quite what to say to it. I don't think of myself as being, uh, you know, like Johnny Cash in the, the sort of strength. I, I, I see myself as something much more... Um, uh, uh, not the farmer, you know, but but I admire that, and 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 I came from the land, and I I love the land. I knew you were from Mississippi, and I wondered if you had say worked on a farm 
uh, well, I, in early, <laughs> your I, early days. I grew up on a farm. My family says that I never did any work on the farm. Now, I remember plowing and uh, hoeing cotton and those things, but my family claims that I never did any of that. So, uh, so perhaps I didn't, but, uh, but I, I, I feel as if I did. And uh, I've always felt very, very close to farm people. And uh, I once lived in Italy for a year, and, and I found that um, farm people all over the world are, are very similar in that they have the same kind of simplicity and the same kind of strength and, and a kind of goodness. And uh, I'm very uh, fond of people that I uh, grew up with in, in Mississippi, and I love going back to the area that I grew up. And I suppose, uh, you know, to many sophisticated people, many of the people there would seem simple and uninteresting, but to me they really are epic people because they have uh, uh, something that's gigantic in stature and curious strengths that uh, are rewarding. I think you could find something interesting in anyone. And I wonder, if that's the reason that you're a playwright, that you study these characters and then you put them into your plays and in your writings, maybe your screenwriting. Well, I think that, that anybody who is a writer is a writer because they see things in a certain way. I mean, there is a kind of hunger, a, a, a certain sort of appetite to, to look at everything and to know what it's like and to, and to define it. And uh, that is, I suppose, what makes a writer, and, and the need to express uh, uh, something of, of, of how you feel about things, uh, and your, your passion for people. And I think that uh, uh, certainly a good artist, or a good writer, which we are not all, but a good writer sees uh, a great deal in people. I see people on a bus. I see faces that move me very much because they express something about the human condition or they, they say something about uh, uh, the triumph over, dis over despair that is in everybody's life. And uh, I see good and bad people and bad and good people. And we are all such complex creatures and we are all so much more than we appear to be. I mean, everybody is. I mean, everybody has much more tragedy and much more uh, uh, capability of happiness or capability of achievement than one sees when you first look. And uh, I hope that I, you know, always have that kind of thing of reading into people uh, uh, the, the enormous capacity for, for life that they have. Isn't it too bad that we can't look inside of every person and see this underlying depth because uh, we miss a lot, don't we, by mm -hmm. overlooking yeah. that. Yeah. And sometimes people that might seem cold and indifferent to us, if we just knew some of the, the facts thing in their going lives. on in their mind at that very time. Uh, mm -hmm. Mark Twain once uh, uh, said something which I, I, I can't quote because I don't really know it well enough, but he said something about uh, uh, the, the writing of an autobiography. And he said that he couldn't write a, an autobiography because the facts of one's life don't tell the story. Because the things that go on in our mind all day, each day, are an incredible drama. I mean, we go through so many uh, uh, ideas and, and, and things in one day and crises that, uh, that, that people aren't aware of. I mean, we go on doing what we have to do. But, but the fears and uh, uh, defeats and triumphs that are actually going on don't really appear on the surface. And the new things that come into our lives, too. I, I'm, right now, I'm being selfish and thinking about myself, though. Uh, two or three days ago, I never dreamed that I'd be sitting here with you having this experience. And uh, it, it's just uh, delightful to, to talk with you and, and share some of these views. Well, it's delightful to me to talk with you. I, I feel that there is a kind of special privilege in life of being able to meet many different people people. I love to meet people. And, and, you know, one meets for only a few minutes, but you sort of 
reach out and touch with your hands, with your eyes, and with your hearts. And, and for a moment, um, we breathe into each other's lives something of whatever of sweetness and hope and belief there is in us. And it, it, we get strength from each other. And that's a very exciting thing about life. And it's bound to stay with us, too, even though we may forget it. There's that lasting impression that's right. there, and nothing can take it right. away. We move on, and, and uh, we forget people's names that we've met, and yet everything remains a part of us, whether we remember it or not. And, and we give things to each other that we don't know we're giving. Do you think that um, artists or people involved in the arts have a deeper sense of this feeling than possibly people who haven't had the opportunity to be exposed to art in any form? Well, I think they have, have a deeper sense of exactly the same thing that everybody else has. I think that what makes uh, people respond to art is that the artist uh, tells you something that is already within you that you don't know how to express. and, and and I, uh, either you see it in the case of a painting, or you read it in the case of a book or a play, or you hear it in the case of music. And, and without being able to define what it is, you recognize something in another's experience that somehow relates to something in you. you know. Let's talk about you yourself now and some yeah. of uh, your many accomplishments. Uh, you're a playwright, and you've done, uh, I think you're working on a musical. Now. Yes, I, I, I'm working on two, actually. I, I'm one of those people who's done a lot of things in his life. None of them, I always say, particularly well. I was an actor for many years and used to appear in, in what's now called the golden age of television, which was the early 50s when there were many shows in New York. Uh, I used to appear on Studio One in those television shows, but then about uh, 58, I wrote a play uh, called How Do You Like Your Blue-Eyed Boy, Mr. Death? Now, the play has never been done, but because of it, I began writing for movies. And uh, since then, I've been an editor of a magazine, and I've written articles. And I'm now writing um, two things for Broadway, One, uh, both musicals. One is a rewrite of the Cole Porter show, Anything Goes, which was done in 1934. And uh, it's supposed to be revived on Broadway this fall with my new version of the book. The other thing I'm doing is a, a, a totally new uh, music, a book for a musical based on the life and work of Dorothy Parker because uh, uh, Dottie was a great friend of mine. I knew her in the last uh, 10 years of her life and uh, uh, I've been asked to do this musical and I'm very excited about that. How, uh, how do you go about uh, doing a musical, say, on the, on the life of a person like that? Well, I tell you, the thing with Dottie is very uh, strange. I, Dottie never told the truth about her life. I mean, she would begin to talk about her childhood, and what she said may be true or it may not be. And so I'm taking that as a, a sort of point of departure. For one thing, it eases my conscience because I know she would be furious with me for doing a musical based on her in the first place. Uh, and, and the things that I'm putting into the musical are not necessarily true because uh, what Dottie always said was not necessarily true. So I'm taking Dottie telling her own story and using uh, stories that she wrote as if they happened to her. But we say in the beginning, I mean, we have it make it clear that she is saying this happened, but it, it, it may not be true that she never happened. That way we can do um, many different things. For instance, uh, the Algonquin Round Table, where uh, Alexander Woolcott and Dorothy Parker and uh, Robert Benchley and George S. Kaufman uh, all gathered and supposedly said brilliant things, Dottie always claimed that it had never happened and that she despised all those people. And, and uh, so th what I'm doing with that, I'm writing that as an op operatic number with each of them trying to top each other musically and it ends with uh, where they're all down at the footlights uh, uh, all singing about something separate at the same time and kind of battling with each other with music. And uh, so it's a sort of operatic number, a mock opera number, really. I can just picture that in my mind. It, it sounds wonderful. It, it really does. Now, do you write the music, too? 
Oh, heavens no. No, no. No, uh, I will have to do the, the book, and then we will approach various composers and see if somebody wants to write music, you know, once they know what the book will be like. If they, if they respond to that and feel that they could uh, write appropriate music, then they would agree. And that's a process that takes quite a lot of time. I would, I would think this couldn't uh, go on for a couple of years. You mean the, the writing process, the, uh, the production well, process? Well, the, 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 uh, pr the production process. I should have it finished. Uh, well, I've promised that I'll have Anything Goes finished about the middle of July. So I hope that I'll have uh, uh, some form of the book of the Dotty musical um, by uh, September, October, maybe November. Then uh, the composer, depending upon whether he's somebody who works fast or not, uh, it might take another year before there was a show to start casting or to start raising money for or, you know, to begin the, the process of production. Sometimes it can take many years. I have two questions I want to ask you from that. First, I want to ask you if you're working on both of these at the same time and how you do it. And before I forget it now, I want to ask you too, um, when you write these books, do you uh, have a certain cast in mind, do you, without realizing it, maybe think this person would be so good in the leading part, but then somebody else takes over, and I suppose you don't have anything to say about that. Answer that first, and then let's go back to this other. Right. Well, uh, several things on that. Uh, the, the Dorothy Parker uh, thing, I'm writing for Patrice Mansell, the opera singer, because she and her husband have the rights to Dottie's life. Uh, so I have her in mind as I write. Uh, with uh, Anything Goes, uh, Ann Miller is going to do it uh, this summer in St. Louis, and so I do think of Ann Miller as I write, and it can't help uh, influencing what you do. For instance, um, once I was, I was approached by uh, Peter Glenville about doing the, the, the uh, screenplay of a book called Devil in Bucks County, and I said, I hate it, I hate that book, it's a silly book, I wouldn't, you know, I mean, I really don't want to do it. It's a, it's a dumb story, and, 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 and I don't respond to it at all. And he said, but if I told you that Simone Signore were going to play the part, and I said, ah, that's a different thing, then I began to see it, you know, it makes the whole story uh, different. If, if these absurd things are happening to Simone Signore, it gives it a kind of stature and dignity, and, uh, and I began to write it. And the, the Henry Fonda was going to play the, the, the man in it. And Henry Fonda has a beautiful face, and it's a, it's a tender, touching face. But you don't think of Henry Fonda initiating an action. I mean, things happen to Fonda. He doesn't do things to other people. So I was writing it really as a very passive part. Then uh, Peter said to me one day, uh, 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 Peter Finch is in town, I'd like you to meet him, because maybe he will do this instead of Fonda. And I met Peter Finch, and he's a very active person. And I immediately began to rewrite the scenes, because when, you know, you think of an actor doing certain things, and it does uh, influence uh, very much what you do. I, I, I have known uh, uh, people to be cast in a part that I had thought of for somebody else, and then I wished I could go back and change it to fit that person. Now, how, how can you manage to write these two plays at one time? Do you get mixed up, or do you have to set aside certain times for one and certain times for another? Well, the answer is that I'm really working on anything goes to get it finished and then get back to Dottie, which I had started. I have worked uh, on two things at one time, and sometimes, um, one can go to the second project, let's say, to get away from the first. Because in writing, uh, many writers feel, as I do, uh, they hate writing and they'll do anything in the world to avoid it. And um, there, there are points when one's writing, on, uh, writing a thing, a book, play, whatever, when you think it's absolutely uh, terrible and, and, and it makes you very upset even to see it and think, you know, I mean, how can I write so badly? Because however well you do it, 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 it is so far below what you hope for. I mean, everybody wants to be Tolstoy or Shakespeare or Chekhov, and, and we aren't. I mean, we're much less. And, and so we judge our work and find it wanting and, and uh, want to get away from it. And sometimes to have two projects going, you, you can escape from one by going to the other. And then you go back to the first one and you say, well, that's not really as bad as I thought it was. Isn't that funny how, how we, we hate to do certain things and yet we can't live without it. We have to do it. 
but I know so often I will do anything to keep from doing the thing that I, that I really want to do most. I'll find little uh, inconsequential things to do. Do yeah. you find that, that you're yeah. always picking up papers or decide to clean a drawer out or something when you ought to be yes. writing? Yes, or telephone or eat an apple or, or sharpen a pencil or anything. It's a very common problem with artists. I, I, um, I suppose really it has to do with the fear of doing it badly. I mean, the feeling that you're not going to do it as you want to do it, and therefore you will postpone doing it, and then you haven't uh, been defeated so long as you haven't done it. Uh, it's a very common problem with artists. I, I always maintain that I could go forever without writing. I really uh, uh, hate doing it. And <laughs> most writers who do have a compulsion to write, for instance, uh, uh, Tennessee Williams, um, don't talk well. And, and, and people used to say to me, I mean, before I really became a writer, George S. Kaufman used to say to me, you're the only person that I've ever known who I know is a writer who doesn't write anything. And, and they'd say, if only you didn't talk so much. You talk, you talk it all out. But, but, but I don't know, there's something about being a Southerner. I, I'd much rather talk because there is somebody there. Uh, Sam Berman tells a story about Sinclair Lewis, who was a great novelist but uh, who wrote terrible plays and, and, and once put uh, his own money in a play to get it on. And Berman said, why do you insist on, on producing this play, which everybody tells you is bad, and, and, and when you write such great novels? And Sinclair Lewis said, because to write a novel, I go up to Vermont and I'm all alone in a room for a year. And, and in doing a play, there are people all around and they're, they're acting your parts and all that. And you feel there are people there. And I'm gregarious. And that's why it's worth it to me to put the money in this play. And one certainly understands how he feels. Well, I, I'm certainly glad for my sake and for the sake of all the people who are listening that you not only write, but you talk. Because uh, it, it's just been... Uh, so interesting to talk with you, and we still have just a minute or, or so longer. Uh, what else would you like to tell me about yourself? Well, let me tell you not about me, but about Nashville, because, because I really am so thrilled. I, of course, uh, having grown up in the South, I know what Southern people are like, but, but it's so thrilling to Gloria to come to a place where people make her feel so at home and are so welcoming, and people have gone to such lengths to be kind and generous and considerate of us. That, that, that I would really like to say thank you to everybody for being the, the kind of warm human people that they are. Well, you and uh, Gloria Vanderbilt Cooper have brought so much to Nashville, and we thank you for coming. And uh, just as we were saying, you meet a person casually, and that person makes a lasting impression on you. And you've made a lasting impression on Nashville, and we'll look forward to your coming back, both of you. Well, thank you very much. I think we're going to be back in March. There's going to be a Vanderbilt family reunion, so we hope to be back then. That was Wyatt Cooper, who, along with his wife, Gloria Vanderbilt Cooper, was in uh, Nashville recently. The Gloria Vanderbilt retrospective exhibit will remain through July 9th at the Tennessee Fine Arts Center at Cheekwood. This is Lynn Folk on Gallery of the Arts.